Yeah. I don't think they're ready for this. Gotta give it Forget about it. Hey, yo, at the speed of sound. It's the world now, wax works compound. So gather around and witness something that is rarely found. The Database Building Block seminar series is filmed in front of a live studio audience. This program is made possible by Google. All right, guys, let's get started. Uh, we're excited today to have Luke Kim. He's the CEO and co-founder of Spice AI. Um, so he's going to be talking about what they've been building and how they use building blocks inside of the, the system. Um, as always, if you have any questions for Luke, feel free to interrupt him at any time. And that way, it's a conversation for him and not him talking to the void of Zoom for uh, for for an hour. Again, Luke, thank you so much for being here. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't do the intro. This is Luke. He's awesome. Go for it. Thanks, Andy. Andy, uh, it's awesome to be here. Um, yeah, really excited. Um, so yeah, as Andy mentioned, I'm Luke uh, Kim, founder and CEO of Spice AI. I also wanted to call out my co-founder Philip LeBlanc, who's very instrumental to the project. Um, and together, we have uh, you know over 25 years of experience working on a whole bunch of different platforms. Uh, at Microsoft. Um, the last couple of years, I was in the CTO's office in Azure. Got an incubator there called Azure Incubations. Did a whole bunch of different projects, including other open source projects that use building blocks. So Dapper, for example, there is a um, runtime for building distributed applications using a set of building blocks. Um, but we also worked on GitHub and NPM and a whole bunch of other um, data platforms uh, um, at Microsoft. So given this series is about database building blocks, I imagine there's some interest in building your own database. And so I thought it might be interesting to take you on a bit of a journey on how we actually decide to build one ourselves. Because we didn't actually initially set out to build one. We thought we would be able to use um, other, other, other things that existed. Um, then I will talk through what is Spice um, and what's it used for and give a demo on that. Uh, and then dive pretty deeply into how it works with a focus on federation and acceleration features within the platform, and then how we connect that over to AI. Um, and so if anything, um, for the first part, I want to hopefully encourage anyone who's actually thinking about building a database or building a data system um, and just encourage you that you can do it too. So why build a database? Before I started Spice, I was at Microsoft in the CTO's office, and we were working on a number of different projects. Uh, and a couple of them had to do with the AI feedback loop. Uh, essentially, can you enable a virtuous cycle of improvement uh, for intelligent applications by training in the cloud, uh, building models, collecting more data, fine tuning them, A-B testing them, evaluating them, sending all that data back up uh, and training a new model and doing this cycle over and over again. Um, and so I saw this pattern when I was working with a number of customers uh, there uh, quite successfully, but it's hard and complex. In addition, uh, we were quite interested in how this relates to tiered infrastructure. So not only is that complex, uh, how do you actually make this work across all the tiers of infrastructure from a laptop or a Raspberry Pi or an Edge device through to an on-prem deployment, uh, maybe a POP, maybe a 5G cell tower to a regional cloud all the way up to you know, multi-cloud uh, um, and so forth. And then it becomes really complex. How do you optimize co-location of compute and data? Uh, how do you minimize data transfer, transit? And how do you do all of this with maintaining data privacy and sovereignty? Um, here is a slide from one of our initial pitch decks, which goes to prove that you can make an ugly slide and still raise money. Um, but uh, one of the side projects I was working on at the time was building a neurofeedback training system. And this is where you essentially put an EEG on your brain, which collects a bunch of electrical signal, which is time series data, gigabytes at a time. And uh, you can use this to give feedback back to the brain and get yourself into certain brain states. Uh, and by building this system, um, we ran into a whole bunch of challenges. But really what we wanted to do is make an autonomous decision-making agent, which would make a decision on when to give feedback back to the brain. Uh, and we found it really tough. There were uh, a lacking of tools out there to help us do this. And I also saw this at the same time across the industry as I was working. So I left Microsoft uh, in 21 and uh, founded Spice based on this idea that can you help developers build autonomous decision-making applications by essentially providing a whole bunch of building blocks within a sidecar that um, makes that much easier for them. And this was 21 before ChatGPT. Uh, and uh, if you 
take it today, today you would call this an agentic application and you would probably call the sidecar a copilot. So we set out uh, to build this system um, and we quickly ran into a lot of hard problems. Uh, the first one was we were no longer at Microsoft, and so the data readiness of our design partners was significantly lower than what we used to. Uh, and we found it very difficult to access the data we needed. Uh, a couple of partners said, hey, yes, we can get you some data. It'll be a CSV file on a SharePoint drive. Uh, and we had to talk to a whole bunch of disparate systems, and it didn't work very well. So we accelerated our plans to build um, uh, essentially a cloud data platform so that we could tell partners, hey, just put your data in our cloud and we'll go do all of this for you. Uh, we built it using a whole bunch of existing technologies. We're a startup and so we wanted to move very fast. Um, but we also ran into the problem that was very hard to build without a big test data set. And what we did at the time was look to find an open real-time time series data set that was continually updated, updated and loved lots of different use cases. Uh, and we ended up using blockchain data as that test data set. It was very interesting. We figured out if we could do it for something like blockchain data at tens of hundred terabytes uh, that was continuously updated, we could do it for uh, kind of any um, time series data set. Uh, and we got lots of experience on this. We built a whole bunch of systems, including running DuckDB at massive scale. Um, we had uh, instances where we were doing 300 queries per month per customer, uh, and we had this minimum uh, kind of deployment of 64 cores, terabyte of RAM, for instance. Um, and we had all these huge operational challenges around that. Um, not because DuckDB is uh, not good, it's just not designed to run at the scale uh, in the cloud. And so, for example, we were running DuckDB in memory mode uh, because we wanted to, to have very fast query. Uh, but in memory mode, DuckDB doesn't have a vacuum uh, function. And it only works in, in file mode with a while log. And so we essentially implemented our own vacuum function, which uh, consisted of creating a new DuckDB, a new instance uh, of our service. We call it Docker at the time. Uh, and then moving the workload across to the new instance and killing the old instance. And that was our vacuum. Um, but we got a lot of experience running uh, very high quantities of query at scale um, through, this, through this system. However, actually, we, it's a real we had a major problem. problem that we it's had to solve. So look, yes. so you were running DuckDB in memory mode because you did you just didn't the, the data you didn't care about keeping around or like you just didn't wonder this was too too slow or like what was That's the right. choice? Yeah, so this was our real time query system. We had all of the data permanently in data lakes um, that we could query using other systems. And so for this uh, three hundred million requests per month system, we kept it all in memory just for high high performance. Okay. Um, um, a request serving back to front ends and, and applications. Uh, it's, a, it's a cache. Got it. Thanks. Exactly. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, we didn't solve the other problem. And the other problem was every time we went and talked to an organization, they would have data all over the place. You would talk to, I talked to an organization just the other day, they're 350 data sources, uh, and they were acquiring two to three companies every quarter. And every time they acquired a company, they got another 10 data sources. Um, and so you had all this data spread across both modern stores like Databricks and Snowflake, but also legacy stores. Like the number of people I talk to have CSVs and FTP, a lot, um, and SQL Server and these types of things. Uh, and it's also structured data and unstructured data uh, that we have to deal with. And so there was this big chasm, uh, not to mention how do you actually get that data efficiently into models in AM. Um, and if you kind of look from 21 till now, um, uh, as Gen AI has um, really uh, started to be used in the enterprise, you see this rise of RAG. Um, and it still has a lot of challenges, right? Today, I think you would agree, um, probably with Mark, that um, it's still not at the accuracy that we need it to be. Um, and often this is because it just doesn't have access to all the data it needs. Um, it's hard to give an accurate answer if, you, if it's not data backed. Um, but as, if, as soon as you give access to all of the data, then you have the opposite problem, which is you can spill data everywhere. And so it not only needs to be full knowledge, it has to be secure. You have to have a sandbox of data. Uh, and to just illustrate this point, here is an example of us using our system, uh, using OpenA in the back end, where we're asking, hey, who were the top committers to this open source project called Nginx? Uh, and it gives you this very verbose answer. But once you connect the uh, GPT-4 over to data, then you can ask the same question and you get a very succinct, exact data-driven answer back, right? And this is basically RAG. 
Um, but, and of course, uh, you can actually go and verify that the answer is correct. So here we can just do the query on the data. We see it's actually correct. Um, so um, being data-driven, being grounded in data is really, really important when it comes to um, um, serving real-world use cases. So the journey up until now, through all of these AI feedback loop, um, through neurofeedback, through data platforms, all of, all of these working with customers, we had cobbled together uh, and had to maintain all of this crazy infrastructure using all these technologies that really just wasn't designed specifically for the use case that we wanted it for, which was how can you enable agentic applications across multiple infrastructure tiers uh, in real time, essentially. And we wanted it to be full knowledge uh, to access across all these disparate data sources, modern, legacy, multimodal, but also we want it to be very secure uh, so that you can actually deploy it in the enterprise. Um, many of the large bulky systems, you simply just not want to deploy um, for the AI use cases because the enterprises want to run it within their, their infrastructure, maybe on-prem, maybe at the edge. Um, they don't want this data leaking into the cloud. So we came to the conclusion that what we really needed is an AI native database. Uh, and we looked around and we didn't see anything that met specifically our needs, especially around that tier optimized solution where you could run it all the way to the edge. <clears throat> but uh, now that a few years had come along uh, and so much great work has been put into the community with building blocks like Arrow and Data Fusion and Iceberg, it's now feasible for a startup of less than 10 people, which we were, uh, to actually build one, which is super cool. So what is Spice OSS? Well, uh, you can think of it uh, as itself a set of building blocks, but instead of for databases, for data-driven applications. <clears throat> it's a single node compute engine for data and AI, uh, super lightweight, high performance written in Rust, um, and you can run it anywhere from laptop all the way up to cloud and across multiple tiers. Um, platform agnostic, uh, and it really helps developers compose together components to use in a data, app, a data and AI application, which includes databases, models, LLMs, tools, and helps provide the feedback loops between them so that it can learn and improve. And the, some of the data and AI building blocks that we have are a federated SQL query engine based on Apache Data Fusion, uh, which you saw at the first uh, um, uh, uh, seminar in the series, and um, acceleration and materialization using um, Data Fusion, which is Arrow in, in, in memory, uh, DuckDB, SQLite, or Postgres. Um, we're also considering adding CHDB there as well. Um, search, um, vector search right now um, with hybrid search and, and graph search and other types of searches coming along the way. Um, MR inference, so you can load a model and a ga an AI gateway if you want to use a hosted model um, and a set of tools that you can um, uh, use uh, um, to make it better, basically, essentially. So here's what it looks like visualized um, in you, the orange box in the middle is the runtime. So you think single binary container deployable set of forward building blocks. And these are presented over standard API. So standard database API, Apache Arrow Flight, JDBC, ODBC, uh, and a standard OpenAI compatible API. So you can use the OpenAI SDK or the Vercel AI SDK and connect to it just looks like OpenAI. And because all of these four building blocks are in the same runtime, what you get is the ability to track all the data flows between them. So we can start adding in hooks for monitoring and observability, control and policy, uh, which is all the things that you actually need when you're actually building this and putting it into production, especially in the enterprise. And you can con connect to structured data, unstructured data and uh, models, including pulling down a model from Hugging Face or loading it from file um, and into the runtime. So here's an example of probably the simplest use case that you can use it for. Um, and you can uh, essentially pair it with other data systems. So we work with Barracuda. Uh, they had a ton of data in Databricks and it was making their queries slow for their application. Uh, we were able to improve that by two orders of magnitude to 150 milliseconds at the P99. Uh, and we did this by simply dropping in Spice uh, with almost no changes to their application because they were talking to Databricks using ODBC and they can talk to Spice using ODBC. And we essentially prefetched uh, the last seven days of data, which was 99% of their queries, uh, and stored it within DuckDB and served it up to the application. Um, so think similar to what we were doing in the cloud example with CloudScale DuckDB, um, but this case 
uh, much more specialized and specific for the application itself. Uh, and so basically wait, what's happening wait, so, is- so, all... so, Sorry, that, so that example right there, it's just, again, Spice is just an emery cache in front of Databricks. And that, is yeah. it actually you doing- of it, You can think of it uh, as a cache and I'll go into this in a little bit later uh, slides, um, but it's uh, you can think of it more of a replica of a subset of the data. Um, so if you had a hundred billion rows in Databricks, um, what they were doing essentially is taking a subset of that, which was the last seven, a window of seven days, uh, and sometimes down to the tenant and keeping that within DuckDB to serve directly to the email application. Uh, and then Spice does all the work of keeping it up to date, uh, evicting all data, uh, refreshing it and so forth. Got it. So it's a little okay. bit different than just a pure cache. So at this point though, there's nothing like th this example here, there's nothing but the, the vector search or any of that. It's just like, Correct. This is the okay. simplest use case. The simplest use case, and that data risk could be almost anything. It could be Snowflake, could be Postgres, could be MySQL, and so forth. Um, and uh, um, yeah, just the simplest use case of using it for data acceleration. Okay. Awesome. Thank you. I have a quick question, uh, if you don't mind. <laughs> so you mentioned that they were using ODBC to talk to Databricks. So I'm just wondering, does this did this work particularly well because the queries that they were sending to ODBC happen to overlap with, you know, DuckDB, I don't know if I'd say like, kind of like the SQL dialect, or is it actually just that, you know, you know, I, I guess I'm just asking, like, is it like a SQL dialect related thing? Or is it just at the level of ODBC, DuckDB, and whatever Databricks uses uh, the actual query engine portion, like they just have really good alignment? Yeah, uh, um, I wouldn't say not specifically. So Spice supports a whole bunch of protocols. Um, JDBC, ODBC, uh, ADBC, Flight, HTTP. Um, what the, the point I was making is that it was just drop-in. So um, there was really almost no changes to the application. You can talk to Databricks on a number of protocols as well, uh, including um, uh, Spark, uh, Delta Direct, um, so a different bunch of different protocols, and Spice supports all of those. Um, but the point was that you could just drop it in with really minimal changes. Now, if you're asking about dialects on the front end, Spice supports uh, PostgreSQL or Snaps or PostgreSQL dialect. Um, and you'll see later in the talk when I get into federation of how we translate that into different dialects in the back end so that you talk to a database in its, in its native way. Okay, thanks. Um, so here's what's happening. If, before Spice, your application is just talking to this backend system. And often that can be a big, centralized, bulky cloud managed system. And you're at the mercy of its concurrency system, round trips across the network. It's normally high latency. You normally have low concurrency. And so one way of deploying Spice, which is what they did here, is deployed as a sidecar. So you actually put it on the same machine or the same node as the application. And what that allows is the application to talk to that instance over a low latency, high performance IPC, uh, local loopback essentially. And then Spice will do all of the work of managing the data refresh back into DuckDB or it could be SQLite um, uh, for you essentially. Um, and I'll get into a little bit later uh, how that refresh works. <laughs> Thought that might be the question. I normally got the question at this, at this point. <laughs> um, that, 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 that was my question, yes. Keep going. It, um, uh, it's not the only way you can deploy it. You can deploy it as a set of microservices uh, in between, as a cluster. Um, and you can actually chain these. So you can point one Spice to the other Spice instance. And if you do that, you can really, this really helps for tier optimization. Uh, we can actually push data down uh, as we know, get new data or as we know of new data closer to the source. Um, and uh, you can start pushing down predicates and filters and these types of things as well. Um, one other uh, difference of Spice is that um, I think I heard the Terso DB guy say, um, you should just give every customer their own database. Well, you can do that with Spice as well. Uh, and we often see that a lot. So uh, maybe you have a big customer, customer A, you give them one Spice instance or a set of Spice instances, and maybe they're really big. So you give them like 20 calls. Uh, and then Spy customer Spice B, then you just give them 200 milli calls. Um, and so what it allows you to do is really optimize your environment uh, for each customer. And you don't have to worry about like RLS and all these types of complex things to actually do that. You just give every customer their own database. Um, so yeah, that was, I'm going fairly fast because I've got a lot of content, um, but uh, hopefully that gives you a, a quick um, overview of what Spice is. And so we can kind of get into some demos and how it actually works. 
Um, all right, so the first demo I'll give is uh, a very basic um, demo here. Uh, and so here I have a, um, you guys can see my VS Code window, right? Yes. Yes, okay. So I have an empty VS Code project. Now, uh, we really have a developer focus at Spice, and so we wanted to make it super easy. Um, and so you can get the Spice CLI um, by just one command. And um, Spice, we also wanted to, to make, be like building blocks. And so something like NPM, you can get packages. We wanted to make that where you can get data and model packages. So we can do Spice add, like you'll do, say, yarn or NPM add, and I can do Spice AI quick start here. Uh, and that will pull down this spice dot yaml, which you can kind of think of as like a package.json. And it's got one dependency here. And if I go into that dependency, you'll see that uh, it's quite simple. It's got this data sets node, and it's got one data set, which is a bucket pointing to S3. We're calling it taxi trips. Uh, and it's in the file format parquet. Um, and we have the acceleration thing here. I'm just going to turn the acceleration off for the purposes of this demo initially. And I'm going to run the runtime. Remember, a single binary, uh, you can run it on your laptop, you can run it kind of anywhere. Um, and so we're going to start the, the runtime. And it um, starts up a couple of different uh, endpoints here. I'm going to start one more uh, console window here. And we have another command, SpiceSQL, which is uh, just a little REPL that we have. And I'll run that. And that will connect over to the runtime and allow me to run queries. So now I can say show tables. And you'll see I've got the tables here, and I've got that taxi trips table that I've set up there. And so now I can just run queries against this taxi trips table. Um, so I might do something like that. Um, and what it's doing is using the runtime to go to that parquet file on S3, run the query against it using data fusion, uh, and giving me back running results. And so that comes back in about one, uh, almost two seconds. So what happens if I go back over to the Spice YAML uh, and uh, I can say acceleration true here? Um, so I'm just going to do that. I'm just going to remove this for now. <clears throat> uh, and then uh, I can use different mechanisms of acceleration. So if I just did this, it would be arrow in memory. But I could also just do duck, engine duck DB. Uh, this could also be SQLite. Um, it could also be PostgreSQL. Uh, and I'm going to say mode file and save that. And so you'll see up the top here, it's actually created a duck DB file. It's just a, it's just a standard duck DB database. Uh, and so if I come back across to my SQL REPL here, I can rerun the same query, and you'll see that it's two orders of magnitude faster. Instead of taking two seconds, it's 0 0.01 seconds. And that's because it's running the query locally on the local DuckDB instance, and in the background, the runtime actually loaded the data uh, automatically for it. Um, and the reason why this is a little bit different to a cache is that now I can do a whole bunch of compute on that. Um, so I could run complex queries and um, you don't have to worry about them just being purely materialized. Now, the next thing I might want to do is I might actually want to join this data with another type of data, right? Um, so if I bring this one in here, then uh, in addition to the S3 data set, I've got a Postgres data set, uh, and I'm going to call it PG Taxi Trips, and I'm just going to create a view that unions the two. Um, and so uh, one additional thing is that this PostgreSQL data set is pretty slow. So I can also do acceleration here. And I'm going to say enabled equals true. Uh, but in this case, I don't want all the data that's in PostgreSQL. Uh, and so I just want to take a subset of data. And so I can actually say select star from taxi, some PG taxi trips where fair amount is greater than 30. And so now when I rerun that, um, I will be able to load, and you'll see that it's loading the data in the back end. Um, and uh, if I was to come across to my SQL REPL here and do show tables, then I've got PG taxi trips, old taxi trips, taxi trips, and uh, I can say select out. Oops, I can actually pipe one from PG taxi trips. Then uh, it's going to um, run the run the actual query. Now, did I not accelerate that? Oh, wait, sorry, I did. I forgot to uh, put my uh, semicolon at the end. So let me rerun that. <clears throat> and you can see it's very very fast. And so what I can actually do now is run queries across both tables um, very fast. So I might actually do something like select average uh, 
fair amount. Oops, really come from all taxi trips, and I could say where a uh, fair amount, and someone give me a number between ten and thirty. Twenty-four. Twenty-four. Uh, well, actually, because I filtered thirty before, why don't we do thirty-four? Um, and so, uh, wait, hey, did I not do that? Uh, Type on missing, amount. missing an amount. N amount. Oh, yeah, thank you. Uh, and the end. Yep. Yeah. There you go. So there I've been able to run the query extremely fast across both data sets because they were both stored in memory. And remember, one was actually a DuckDB on file. So the S3 data was DuckDB on file and the Postgres data was actually Arrow records in memory. And it was able to join across them, do the calculation and return the result back incredibly fast. Can you, can you put uh, explain to see actually what the plan looks like or no? Uh, yes, we'll get into that. Okay, uh, awesome, thanks. Uh, excellent question. So let me come back across to my deck um, and uh, let's see what's going on here. So how does all of this work? Well, uh, Spice is also built on a set of database building blocks. And some of the key design decisions that we've made and bets was a pure open source foundation. So Arrow, Flight, Data Fusion, Parquet, Iceberg. Um, another decision that we made was from our learnings around running DuckDB at cloud scale, was sometimes you actually want a row-based uh, OLTP database. And so we'll support both DuckDB, SQLite, and we actually have key value on the roadmap. Uh, and of course, we wanted to make it as, as developer-friendly as possible. So that's why you see things like these uh, package registry of, of these data sets and models uh, and a really fast feedback loop to be able to build upon. Um, so let's look into some of your questions. So how does federation acceleration work under the covers? Um, so what were our goals for the Query Federation? Again, if you come back to the, what I um, said at the start was, we had this problem, how do you actually in the enterprise access data wherever it lives? And this becomes a lot more important when it comes to AI, because if you're just building an application before, it's you can talk to one or two data sources, no problems. Uh, if you actually want an accurate answer back from your, uh, your chat GPT, uh, it needs access to all that data wherever it lives. Uh, and it could be in some old legacy store. Um, in addition, we wanted to ensure that we keep the compute next to the data. So can we push as much compute to the underlying database and do as little work in the runtime as possible? So if you take any, a, a query like this, for example, you are selecting across two different tables, sorry, three different tables, two different databases. <clears throat> How does this actually work? Uh, so we make use of Data Fusion uh, and um, Data Fusion will pass that query into a logical plan. And this is the initial logical plan. And it looks something like this, where you have a rejection, you're gonna do a join. Uh, we didn't actually have the join in the full query at the top, um, uh, and then a cross join down the bottom. And we can implement this because Data Fusion has itself a bunch of building blocks, which are awesome. Uh, and one of those is a table provider where you can actually implement your own ability to talk to a different data source. Um, and it just looks like a table in Data Fusion. The problem with the by uh, the, the out of the box table provider is that it only supports uh, a set of pushdown. And by pushdown, I mean the ability to take um, filters uh, and limits and aggregations and push them down into the um, uh, uh, um, underlying uh, data source um, so that you don't have to bring all of the data back into data fusion and join it within memory, which is what you would have to do otherwise. And what happens out of the box? So, uh, there is a package called Data Fusion Federation, and here's how it works. Um, it runs as essentially an optimizer rule um, after the analysis, and uh, it looks at all of the, um, the logical plan and looks to find the largest subtree of the plan. And then it will replace those larger subtrees for each of the underlying databases with these federated nodes. And these federated nodes will then um, take everything within that subtree, convert it to a, a SQL for the actual underlying base, database and send it to that underlying database. Um, and so uh, I'm gonna walk through step-by-step step how this happens. So imagine that you had a query that joins multiple tables in one database and un unions it with um, a, a table from another database. Uh, so it looks like something like this. You have the logical plan uh, and it's going to go top to bottom until it finds a leaf. And then it's gonna go bottoms up 
uh, as it uh, um, finds essentially um, uh, the subtrees for the data for each data source. And so we've got two circles here. The left one is, is it federated? And the right one is the data source that it belongs to. And so it's going to walk down for each um, node and say, hey, is that um, what, what, what data source is a part of? In this case, it's DuckDB. And we say, oh, this is DuckDB. And we keep walking up and we say, oh, these are both DuckDB. Uh, and then it walks across, oh, this is DuckDB. It walks up, it's DuckDB, all the way up to the top. And then it walks across and it's like, oh, this is actually a different data source. It's Postgres. Uh, and then it walks up, oh, this is still Postgres. Uh, and then it gets to the union. And so it's basically found the two largest subtrees for where all the data sources are the same. And then it takes those two sources and replaces them with federated nodes. Uh, then it checks off on the union here, the, all the inputs to this, to this is federated. So we've already decided that this is all federated below. Uh, and so it won't try and do that again. Uh, and then it adds a state to the top, uh, and um, that way it's able to um, decide what it should actually federate. And so then if you look at what happens between underneath the federated loads, uh, the, feder the data fusion logical plan essentially becomes this intermediate representation that we can use to call other databases. And so each one of these federated nodes, we will use what's called the unparser in uh, data fusion. And that simply takes the uh, logical plan and converts that subtrade logical plan, takes the AST and converts that into the dialect for each database. Uh, and so we were able to call each database in its uh, native dialect here. Uh, but that comes with a whole bunch of challenges, uh, specifically uh, type conversion. So um, sometimes this is easy. So if it's, say, DuckDB, DuckDB basically supports arrow types out of the box. And so it makes it very easy. We can basically say, here's a DuckDB, arrow, arrow, a DuckDB type. It's now an arrow type. But if it's something like a Postgres uh, row conversion with a whole bunch of other types, we have to do essentially convert rows to columns and Postgres types to arrow types. And so we've done a huge amount of work um, in uh, the, the table providers um, and the federation um, repositories within Data Fusion to actually make this work. Um, and then on the other side, when we actually take arrow data and we put it into one of our acceleration databases like .db or SQLite, we have to take a arrow record essentially and convert it into an insert statement. <laughs> Uh, and so we, we, but this is a lot more simpler because um, we don't have to do a whole bunch of conversion. We just have to um, basically create the, the SQL statement. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's a whole bunch of work to do this. Um, but once you've done it, once you've, you, you, you've done it, you get essentially this way to use consistent Postgres across anything in the backend. Um, and for the most part of it, <laughs> it does have some limitations. Uh, so one of the limitations is uh, until you go and map all UDFs, uh, you currently limited to Data Fusion built-in functions, um, and so you can't really call backend UDFs because you're simply using Data Fusion uh, Postgres SQL dialect in the front end. Um, and then it's mainly only implemented for SQL-based providers, uh, but you can use you can do this for anything else. Uh, and I'll show you how that's really interesting and what we actually do there as well on how we actually use this to convert from Postgres SQL to GraphQL. <clears throat> so there you have uh, two sub projects of Data Fusion, which themselves are data bu uh, uh, building blocks. Um, data Fusion Federation, which enables that replacing of the subtree to federated nodes, and Data Fusion Table Providers, which is a set of providers that does that conversion back into the backend data store. Um, and Spice AI, we co uh, contributed the Data Fusion Table Providers repo, um, and we do a lot of work in the Federation. So would love if anyone wants to help contribute, that would be awesome. All right, but you can do this not just uh, SQL to SQL. So what we actually do is we use this also for SQL to GraphQL, and we do it for other types of um, query systems as well. <clears throat> I see a question. Um, yeah, go, go for it, yes. Um, yeah, so I wanted to ask, uh, like, how does the interaction, so I'll say this, in the first example, you mentioned that, like, part of the speed up is, like, you're caching a bunch of data in quote, unquote, cache. But uh, what I'm curious about is, how does the view materialization essentially interact with, like, your federated nodes, right? Like, are you able to essentially materialize 
a query that actually spans two federated nodes? Uh, yes, yes, you are. Yes. So the query will um, will span. So let's say I say I take this query that um, in my example, right? Um, then oh, this one here. So this is spanning across multiple tables and across multiple databases. And so what we can do, the way the materialization will work is uh, it'll take the result of that query and store it in DuckDB or take the result of that query and store it in um, Arrow records in memory. And so then all of your subsequent queries are just going to be on that essentially embedded database in the runtime, uh, which was the result of that query. <clears throat> awesome. Thank you. And then Robert, have a Robert, follow up yeah, go question ahead. if possible. Yes, go ahead. Uh, hey, this is uh, Joseph Kushko, by the way. So I'm just curious for that uh, materialized uh, query, how and when does that get updated in your embedded database, if ever? Yes, great question. I've got a slide on that in about three slides. Um, and then uh, Robert had a question in the chat. Yeah, so. It was about the demo with the acceleration uh, yes. when you constrained the maintained data in DuckDB to a certain data set. Yes. My question around that was like, if you don't have that constraint and you have a large data set, like, how is it able to like, you know, manage like, the back and forth of what's being managed and what's not yeah. when, you're, when you're working a large Yeah. Like, so a large I'll get to a little bit this in the refresh as well, but um, we do. Uh, we can do some tricks. So, for example, if you have time series data uh, and um, you want to just say keep a window of data, then you can use push down. So this this query push down essentially into the backend database to only get, for example, the diff. Uh, and we do things like handle like an overlap for late arriving data and um, you know like an upsert and so forth around that. So there are definitely some tricks you can do to minimize it. But yes, if you want to take the entire database and you want to bring it across every time, uh, then it would be, depending on your data size, it could be a lot of data to, to bring it across every time. Any other questions? All right, so for GraphQL, we can do something similar. Um, so here's the problem. Uh, we... Uh, also have a GitHub connector, and we use GraphQL to connect to GitHub and get a whole bunch of data from you. And if you just go and query GitHub, and we want to say, hey, take all of the uh, PRs for, that emerged, um, uh, even for just eight rows of data, it can be very slow. And so this, in this case, we went and took eight rows of data uh, and um, like filtered rows, and it was like 68 seconds, right? And that's because it's similar to the problem that I, des I described before, where if you don't have push down, you've got to pull all the data into data fusion and do filter in data fusion. Um, however, what we can actually do is we can actually push these filters down to the GraphQL query. Uh, and so what we do is we do a similar translation from SQL to, in this case, GraphQL search parameters. Uh, and this works um, not all the time, but it works for most of the cases. And so you can get some really, really big speed ups. And so in this case, we take a query on the left here, which is select author and title, um, where the author is PZ and state equals merge with a uh, time period. And this converts to a GraphQL query and we get just those rows back uh, and it finishes sub-second. And so to, want to add to your previous question, um, you can use things like this to just pull down the additional increments of data that you might need. Imagine doing this on like an updated app since you last refreshed or, or so forth, um, where you're just pulling in the new pull requests. Um, all right, so let's get into uh, a little bit of how these two concepts of federation acceleration um, interact with each other. So uh, one problem that you have when you start doing this is, okay, I want to create this sandbox of data from my application or for my uh, AI agent. Um, and I'm using a bunch of different data sources, but they're all different performance, right? So I'm talking to GitHub with GraphQL, it's super slow. I'm talking to um, S3, getting Parquet files and that. It's reasonable, medium fast. I can do some really fast stuff with Postgre because I can push down the queries, um, but I get this inconsistent performance. And so what we can do uh, is um, take, um, as this was kind of to your question before, um, uh, uh, replicas or subsets of these data store in that materialization um, in these embedded databases to make those queries consistently fast. 
And here is how we can update that. Um, so we have three mechanisms. Um, one, you can set up an interval so you can pull it. So you can say, hey, every hour, every day, uh, or you can, there's an API which you can say, just do it now. So if you know, hey, I just dropped the Parquet file into S3, go and pull that Parquet file down, pull the API and it'll pull it down. And you can add filters to this as well. So if you're doing it, say, every day you might, or every refresh, you might say, hey, I want to pull in all the new taxi trips since my last refresh. Uh, and again, we will do things like manage an overlap for you, do a upsert and so forth, um, so that we ensure that you have you know, the data consistency there. Um, we'll support primary keys and indexes and these types of things. Um, in addition, we support Debezium as a uh, connector. And so you can connect Debezium to it uh, and send essentially each change that happens to your database um, over Kafka stream, uh, sorry, over, a Kaf over Kafka. Um, and uh, we'll apply them within the accelerated table as we get them. And then we're actually made our own mechanism as well because we wanted to support this tier optimized way. And it's essentially doing similar thing that Zbezium does over Kafka, we just do it over flight. And we do it with a do exchange essentially. Um, and so this allows us to actually push these changes as they happen down into that accelerated table. So hopefully this gives you an idea of how that, that acceleration actually gets updated. Um, and then we do other things as well, like evictions and so forth. Um, if you want to keep like a you know a time time window up there and so forth. Uh, any more questions on the acceleration, the the refresh here? Is there any SQL you can't support as a materialized view? And 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 do and do partial like incremental updates? I'm thinking like something like, like materialized or like the because it's hard to do it for any arbitrary SQL. Yeah, it's definitely hard to do for any arbitrary physical, especially like I mentioned, when it comes to the UDFs, um, yeah. if there's like custom things within a dialect, if there's like a, some crazy like type that's just like not supported. Uh, for example, today we don't do a good job with like JSONB, things like that yet. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, and so we get these mappings. Um, but what we find is like for the majority of use cases, uh, it works pretty well. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, so this comes back to, is it a cache? Uh, and I get asked this question all the time. Uh, and so what we say is like, we have two distinct concepts here. We have um, both a cache, which we actually support and this acceleration. And so if you follow what a query happens when it comes in is we'll get a query and this can be over flight, can be over ODBC, can be over HTTP of multiple protocols. And then we'll check our LAU cache. And the cache key that we use for that is the logical plan hash key. And so the cool thing about that is it doesn't matter if you sent the uh, query over flight or if it's over HTTP uh, or if it's slightly different, if it maps down to the same logical plan, we, we will provide the hash back. Um, uh, sorry, we'll provide the, the data back directly on the, uh, on the logical plan hash key. Um, and then if it misses there, we will go and hit the accelerated table uh, and the accelerated table is updated, as I mentioned in the last slide. And then each, each time it's, it's updated, it will invalid in cache uh, for the LRU cache. And then if it misses the acceleration, then we have another mode which you can optionally fall back all the way back to the actual underlying database itself. Um, but there's caveats around that. So um, um, we, we have it off by default, but you can turn it off. <clears throat> So that's how it's kind of different from a cache um, and, and supports, uh, and anyway, we call it kind of a materialization, but it's not 100% materialization because you still have, um, especially if you're using CDC, the ability to have very fresh real-time data uh, within that um, um, local replica of the, data, of, of, of the data. All right, so that really dove through a whole bunch of the kind of the data aspects of federation acceleration of the runtime, uh, how does this all interact with AI? <clears throat> Coming back to kind of some of our original goals for the, for the project. Um, and by the way, I'll just say here that um, we have many, many customers that just use the data aspects of this. You don't need to use any of this AI stuff. So some people are almost allergic to AI these days. Uh, it's okay, you can compile it out. You don't even have to compile it in uh, and you can run it all without any of this. Um, so if we refresh our memory, we have four building blocks. And two of them were around AI kind of use cases. So search, ML inference, and an AI gate. Uh, and so I'd like to demo a little bit of that for you right now. Uh, here is another use case. We essentially created a GPT around the Nginx open source project. 
And it's a little bit more complicated than the other one. We talk to a number of different data sources. So we're taking tickets and CVEs you know, from Databricks and Postgres, commits from GitHub and GraphQL, and documentation we put on FTP just for fun. And we're calling OpenEI here. So let me swap over to our cloud interface. Now, um, everything I'm showing you here will work 100% open source on your command line. You can do all these commands on your command line. You don't need to use our cloud platform, but it's just easier for me to visualize if I use our cloud platform here. Um, so uh, just like before, we have a spyspot.yaml, and so I'm going to go into that. This one's a little bit more um, expressive. Uh, and so we have uh, a data set here. Uh, we have a Databricks data set. Um, we have some connection info, some instructions around uh, metadata. We have this embedding thing, which I'll come back to. Um, then we also have S3, uh, which are CSV files. Uh, we have FTP, which are markdown files. And we have GitHub, which is uh, GitHub commits. Um, and then we have this section here, which is embeddings. Uh, and we're saying, for this one, use OpenAI API. And here's our key. And for this one, hey, just pull down this model from Hugging Face and use that as our embeddings model. Uh, and then for models, we have uh, the ability to, to wire up to any OpenAI compatible. Uh, we're just adding um, support for Anthropic as well. Uh, and we have a, you know, a system prompt and so forth here. Uh, and then the final thing is how you wire this up together is you have uh, this embeddings uh, column here. Let me see if I find this other one that's maybe more interesting. Um, this one here. And all we're saying is, hey, on the column content, of the docs for FTP, uh, use the hugging face model that we pulled down uh, and calculate the embeddings and um, use, use some um, chunking here. Um, all right, so that's a whole lot, but uh, in summary, four data sets, two embedding models, and uh, a couple of OpenAI uh, OP, um, API models. Now we can come across to our playground here, and this just looks like what you saw on the command line. Uh, we can just run. Uh, queries against it. So here's CVV, it's very fast, sub-second query. Um, and um, if you look at, say, the docs one, what you can actually see is that um, we have, for unstructured data, a location, uh, the content of it, uh, and content embeddings uh, are, are around it as well. So I didn't write any application code at all. The only thing I have is that SpicePod.yaml, nothing else. Uh, so if I come across to this AI chat here, then, uh, and I use OpenAI without Spice, um, then I might ask a question, hey, what data sets do I have access to? And it's going to reply back to me, hey, a generic answer, I don't have access to any data sets. Um, however, I can help you. Um, what if now we use OpenAI with Spice? Uh, I can ask the same question, hey, what data sets do you have access to? And without any code on my behalf, it now knows that I have access to these four data sets that we had set up within the runtime. And so, and I've got kind of links back to it. These are actual, uh, the actual data sets here. Um, and so I can start asking questions here. Uh, for example, uh, what were the top CVEs um, in the project related to the you know, quit or something like that? Uh, and it's able to do, you've seen this before, um, uh, uh, you know, a bunch of search across the data sets to find the CVEs uh, related to Quick in the, in the project and give me an answer back. And this is all rooted in data. Um, now, the cool thing about this is it's very fast. Um, it's rooted in data and I didn't have to do any work to actually make it, to wire up the two. Um, I can actually ask other questions, for example, who are the <clears throat> top committers to the project? Um, provide actual commit numbers. And uh, it'll go off and do the query, and it comes back and provides me the actual commit numbers here, right? And so it can access the data systems that are wired up within the runtime uh, to give me back a much higher quality answer than I could otherwise get. Now, not only do we want the ability to connect data to AI and models, and we want it to be accurate, we've got to make this secure. Uh, and you can do that to some degree by just keeping the data that you want access to, you want to give access to the uh, to model in that acceleration and nothing else. Um, uh, and um, you want it to be secure, monitorable, observable within uh, the enterprise as well. So if I come across to this tab here, 
Uh, everything that I was doing there, you can see has been monitored. So uh, all the queries that happened, all the completions that happened, all the vector searches, embeds. Um, and then if I come across to this tab here, then we can uh, actually find the queries that I just did. So we have a full distributed trace um, of uh, everything I did. Here, I actually spelled it wrong. <laughs> uh, but uh, I have all the inputs to the model. Uh, I have all the outputs to the model, which was in my exact commit numbers, how long it took, uh, and so forth. And then I can see all the tools that it used. So um, it doesn't have to guess at what data sets. It can just call this tool, hey, list the data sets I have access to. And it can actually get that and put it into the model. Uh, and then it can run a SQL text to SQL. Uh, and uh, you can see it here. And because we can trace all the data flows, we can see the actual data coming back and forth between it as well. If we wanted to debug that query, I could just open that up in the Query Explorer, run it, and debug the query. Um, and uh, you can see kind of the whole flow here. Um, now, uh, if I go back to my other one, then I can can show, uh, I think for this one here, it did a vector search. So here is the text embed. Um, and here we're just doing a very basic uh, cosine distance similarity search, uh, but you can see the full trace of everything that happened all the way up to the top. Um, and so the benefit of um, having both things in the same runtime uh, is that you can start doing this very fast feedback loop between them. And so sometimes I try and make it fail, um, but uh, it doesn't always work um, to like get the, the query to fail. Um, like I might say, for example, um, who were the top, who were the top Disney princesses or something um, committers. Uh, and uh, sometimes it'll fail to actually get the, the answer. Uh, and we can see everything that happened there, or well, in this case, it didn't work. Um, it'll actually fail to do the query. But if you notice here, uh, actually, if I come back to the other query, uh, this one here, if you notice the query is very fast, 33 milliseconds. Uh, the list data sets was very fast, 0 0.05 milliseconds. And so um, you get this very fast feedback loop, even if it fails to get the query right the first time, it can try four or five or 10 times, often within you know, uh, tens of milliseconds. All right, so let me go back to my deck and walk through a little bit more of how this works. I know we're coming up on time, so I'll continue to move forward. <clears throat> um, all right, so without Spice, here's what's happening, right? You have your client, it's calling the LLM, uh, it gives you back a response. It, if there's a tool call, uh, then it says go and you know run that query across your backend data source, and you have this extra hop all the way to your backend data source. It gets the response back, uh, and then it can take that uh, response from the tool um, back to the LLM. The LLM can take it and give you back your final response. Um, with Spice, you can internalize all of this. So you can essentially say, okay, uh, before any of this happens, okay, we're going to pre create a prefetched acceleration and store it within DuckDB. And it's going to be within the runtime. Uh, now I can do a check completion request uh, and it's going to call a tool, which is all internal. It's not another hop. Um, it's going to go do the SQL query, again, internal, uh, return the response straight back to the LLM. Uh, and the LLM in this case could be, Spice can load and host an LLM, or it can be an AI gateway. Um, and then it can do all this internally and return the response. And so what you essentially get is the ability, and this can work for vector search as well, and any other tool, the ability to internalize all these data and function calls within the runtime, which makes it very fast and allows for a very fast set of feedback. Um, in addition, it can do debugging on top of what it did. So imagine it's doing something like, hey, this query is too slow. Okay, I'm gonna run and explain uh, to actually figure out what the query is doing and try and use that to actually debug the query itself all within the runtime itself. Um, all right, so uh, I'm gonna continue on. I know there's a, there's a lot of content here, so bear with me, we're right at the end. Um, so we have another concept within the platform. Remember I said that um, what you really wanna be able to do is query across all these data sources wherever they are. So uh, structured data source, unstructured data source, GraphQL if you want to. Um, so how do we actually pull in some of these unstructured documents? Well, um, take this query at the top here. We're saying, hey, uh, select star from the table where location is foo bar. Um, the cool thing is we can actually filter on it. So we're not like scanning across all the documents. 
Um, and this might work for something like uh, Google Docs or SharePoint or FTP uh, or File. Um, and so we can fill, we can push that filter down as well to just read the documents within the query. Uh, and then we will go and pull that content within into the platform um, into that acceleration. And so we'll only do it if you actually have an acceleration here. Um, and when we actually use that data to actually calculate embeddings, what you can actually do is um, uh, Spice will, when it calculates embeddings, inject an addition column, which is this content underscore embedding column within the platform, uh, sorry, within the table. Uh, and it will compute that just in time. So when you actually run the query, hey, select from content embedding, it's going to calculate the embedding. Now, as you can imagine, that can be pretty slow. And so if you pair this with acceleration, then you can essentially use this to pre-compute and cache all the embeddings in the accelerated table. Um, and uh, it's going to pass it through the embedding model of which you can choose. It could be a hugging face model, could be opening eye, uh, and use that to store it back within the content embedding uh, a column. And if you want to use your own embedding embeddings, you can do that. If you want to use PG vector, you can use that. Uh, and if you want to point to say uh, the database and it's already got the embeddings there, we can just use those. Um, okay. so. Uh, what this allows you to do is essentially um, have what we call an embedding table provider. And the embedding table provider um, can really pull in data from any source in the back end, right? So now I can calculate a consistent set of embedding space across GitHub and Postgres and OneDrive and uh, some arbitrary, we, we got asked for like, um, what was it, DB2 the other day, an Oracle. Um, and so I can calculate this consistent search space across all of these um, different data sources specifically for the use case of my GPT, essentially, ultimately. Um, and of course, um, you can use the acceleration features to make that super fast uh, across all of these different backend stores. <clears throat> so um, in summary, uh, we're driving towards uh, a, a data-driven AI world. Uh, and what we believe is for, um, for it really to be truly trusted and useful, uh, AI really must be grounded in full knowledge data. Uh, you have to have access to essentially these virtualized sandbox data sets of, of data with consistent search space. Um, and if you don't have that, you'll get what Mark's referring to, basically Clippy, right? And then these things are going to learn and adapt and improve. And you'll do that by enabling fast feedback loops uh, within the system by um, making it really, really easy and fast to internalize things like data access and search and retrieval uh, and function calling across all of these cycles um, through back and forth with the L1. Um, and I'll, I'll just note that we, while we do support, as talked about in a bunch of LNs, we can actually load traditional models as well. And you can use accelerated data for inference into traditional models. <clears throat> so in summary, uh, if you really need to serve a fast set of virtualized views over a disparate set of data sources, you can use Spice to build these specialized high-performance small data warehouses. If you have service with uh, performance or reliability issues, uh, you can essentially use it as a kind of like a database or AI CDN. We can essentially edge load data next to your application. Uh, and if you want to deploy secure AI-driven applications, with all of the monitoring, observability, and security and compliance that goes with it, then you can use Spice as this intelligent AI-driven co-pilot, much closer to the original vision of the project. Uh, so with that, um, thank you. Uh, you can try out Spice. It's on GitHub, super easy to install, Apache 2 licensed, uh, very permissive. Um, get it with one command line. Um, you can run the quick start that I just did in about a minute. Um, and uh, yeah, we, thanks for your interest. and. Um, if there's any questions in the last minute, happy to take them. Oh, I'll talk about that right now. And you're like on the dot, one hour. <laughs> All right. Awesome. And you gave a demo as well. All right. Uh, we have time for a few questions for Luke. I had a follow up to one of Andy's questions. I think I just missed the answer. But for the materializations, when uh, you do the refresh, are you just refreshing the query from scratch or do you have some type of like incremental? updates to the materializations? Yeah, it's it's up to you. So you can actually put in, so here at the top, uh, we're doing an incremental update. So it's saying, hey, pull in the taxi trips where the pickup date uh, is, is greater than last refresh. 
So you could imagine um, just pulling in and you can do kind of do any filter that'll push down. Um, it, it could be a time filter. It could be a customer filter. It could be a state filter, uh, anything that you think would uh, incrementally update it. Um, yeah. If, if, if what you're asking is, can we figure out the incremental uh, diff, diff ourselves? Uh, we don't. Um, we would expect you to know the incremental diff yourself uh, and or use these other mechanisms of providing streaming updates directly to the acceleration. Okay, everybody else? Uh, I was wondering <clears throat> if you, you know, so I guess I'm just generally interested in like substrate and that type of, you know, portable uh, query plan uh, representation. And I'm also curious, like, you know, you mentioned, you know, you're looking at supporting KVs. So I'm curious if there's also kind of a, you know, if there's something that you will or are interested in providing that like spans kind of data models, right? So like, yes. if you have a key value data source and a relational data source, like, is there something in there that you think you can bridge or, you know, is that kind of just handled, you, you think maybe that'd be handled to like totally different level yeah. or layer? So the, sh the, sh the short answer is, yeah, we like substrates is essentially on our roadmap. Uh, we'd love to support it. Um, we pretty small team. Uh, we actually uh, have been building versions of this for a while, but we started the Rust version of this in January. So we've really only been building this for about nine or 10 months. Um, but we know Jock over there uh, at Sundeck and um, we would love to support substrates, do a whole bunch, make, make a whole bunch of this translation much easier, be able to push down plans much easier into, into backend supported databases as well, for sure. Awesome, thank you. Awesome. So my question would be, um, you're using data fusion as like the, the thing that actually does the, you know, the federation piece. I mean, yes. I mean, Postgres foreign data wrappers could also do that, but then you, you'd get the slow query execution. So you don't want to do that. But I think DuckDB is just something similar, although I don't think they have the ability to do the federation. Did you guys consider yeah, so DuckDB? DuckDB is we started off when we did our cloud scale DuckDB, we actually used their Postgre um, extension to query Postgres. Uh, and um, it doesn't have, I, I, they've actually improved it a lot since then. Um, mm -hmm. But at the time it had almost no push down at all. Um, and so uh, we basically couldn't use it. Um, since then, I believe they've improved push down, but they're focused very well and as they should be on making DuckDB awesome, uh, not on like, hey, can I support like 30 different providers and push it down to all of them? Uh, yes. And that's something that we're like we we do, for example. Yeah, so, yeah, so you mentioned that you you guys provided the, the table provider implementations for, I think, a bunch of different data sources. Can you share which one was the hardest to actually implement and work, get, get working well? As, you know, like, which one was the easiest and, and uh, the most fun to implement? Which one's the hardest? Uh, the, some, the easiest ones were things like DuckDB. Um, yeah. so because the data types are exactly the same. Yeah. Um, and so you can really just like, um, just use it directly, use the data, data directly. Um, hold on, where is my, um, I think you passed it. Yeah. Oh, I passed it. I meant to say, wait, did I pass it again? Um, uh, <clears throat> yeah. Oh, okay. Well, I've lost it. Oh, here, here it is. Yes. Um, so DuckDB, something like DuckDB, where you're already using Arrow through, mm -hmm. through that's the, that's for sure the easiest. Um, harder ones are where you're doing like a non-SQL translation. So um, I'm not sure about hard, but like GraphQL um, was definitely a lot of work. Um, things like, um, and then I think anything where you have like big client uh, type differences. Um, is is also um, quite complex, right? Especially when you start getting to like very large types. We wanted to do things like decimal two fifty six stuff like that. Not always yeah. supported across uh, different databases or even runtimes, uh, like um, uh, language runtimes, right? So yeah. those become difficult. Um, and there's definitely a trade off for sure, um, uh, where you're not going to be able to support everything, uh, but um, for the most part, you can, and we're pretty excited, I think, to have something like a variant type supported in Parquet and Arrow, where we can start pushing through, um, you know, different types um, just through that. You know? Yeah, got. It. I mean, like, so I mean, Federated Data is that was the dream of the of the '90s, right? And no one ever actually made it work. Yeah, uh, I think that the you don't necessarily want to just hey federate everything. It's like hey, can I get a specific stage or sandbox of data for my specific specialized use case. And 
for that, it works very well. Uh, and I think as you have much more, more and more AI use cases, you actually don't want to give your AI access to your database. Um, yeah. You want to put something in front of it, uh, just in case, right? Um, yeah. And you want everything that it, it, it touches to be monitored so that like when it starts doing crazy things, you can stop it and know what it's doing and so forth. Um, and at the same time, you want it to be useful. So you want it to give it access to the data it can actually access um, and for it to be fast, right? Mm -hmm. I think that was a case where they had the online chatbot where they sold a car for a dollar. Well, you can imagine, okay, that should have something in it where it's like, okay, here's my price list. Uh, here is the, like the, the absolute floor I can never sell the, the car for. And I have maybe a supervisory model on top of that that says, don't let this thing ever sell a thing for less than this thing in the price list, right? Yeah. 